Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Sunday at Sunnyside today. Today we're doing uh, weed control. We're going to talk about all things herbicide and how to control those little pesky critters in our yards. No more weeds, right? So say hi to Nicole. I'm Trevor here, the general manager. Nicole's back there running the show. Morning. Hopefully everybody got a chance to grab the handout. I got my copy here, so you keep, it keep, keeps me on task that way. I won't start blurbing about maples or something else. But uh, today we're doing a little weed control. So we're going to go through uh, things fast and furious. Um, you know, I thought I'd start with a couple disclaimers, you know, as usual, just to be all honest, you know, there's some things I use in my yard, some things I don't, you know, I'm a natural kind of organic gardener. So yes, I do pop a lot of weeds by hand. I still take the pleasure in crawling around on my knee pad and causing death by uprooting them. So I'm still uh, doing that most of the time, but I do take advantage of some of the natural things we use here, but I certainly don't want to make anybody feel bad if you're choosing the chemical route. So that would be up to you and your own landscape. We'll talk about both. Um, you know, the one thing I'll say, and I'll probably say it eight times is read your labels, please. You know, everybody buys things and either A, waste them by using too much, you know, speaking as a guy, you know, if it says to use two tablespoons per gallon, uh, putting six in there is not going to make it three times more effective. Want to stick with the labels, follow the instructions. Maybe one of the harder things with herbicide um, is you'll see a range on a lot of the labels. So it's going to tell you a mix between one ounces and three ounces per gallon of water. And that's going to be dictated by how pesky those particular weeds you're trying to spray are. So Maybe I send a picture, hey, I'm trying to control this. Should I go on the heavier rate or the lighter rate? Um, easy answer is probably go on the heavier rate. If you're having to spray it, it's probably something that's a little bit noxious. But again, read the labels, please. That'll give you all the information uh, that you need to know. So I got a slideshow going here. We're going to start that right now so we, we stay on our time today. And we'll kind of whip through some information. And I'm going to show you some pictures of a few of the weeds uh, that I see in my yard, and I think most of us right here on the Pacific Northwest see. Um, you know, I know this is going to be a tough one, but there's some folks that probably join us from other areas, other states, uh, perhaps other countries usually happens as well. Um, you're going to need to talk to your local nursery, local professional on your specific weed. Um, I'm not going to probably recognize some of the ones that we don't have growing here. I got a little bit of Eastern Washington in my brain, not having a place in Cleelum. Uh, for a lot of years, but uh, we really are focusing on things that we would see right in our little local area. So if we kind of start, you know, sometimes I try to make these slides halfway funny, you know, to weed or not to weed, that is the question. Um, you know, I would say as a gardener, I would first ask you to kind of assess your situation. You know, how bad is it? Is it rampant with weeds? Is there some weeds? Is there no weeds? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of variables, but um, you know, for me, I always start like, okay, this would be easy to pull with a, with a useful tool, you know, a, a hula hoe or a, a simple weeding tool that you enjoy. Is that going to accomplish the problem? Or am I going to skim it across the dirt, sever the tap root, say, oh, sweet, I got it weeded. And one week later, it returns off that same tap root. So kind of assessing your situation and picking a tool might help you do some hand weeding. You know, is are there things that perhaps... Maybe it's in a garden area or landscape bed or the back 40, wherever in your yard that you're going to mulch. You know, maybe it's like, you know what, if I'm going to mulch three or four inches with bark or compost and I bury those weeds, will that solve the problem? You know, a lot of times if we change the soil level um, on some simple weeds like that, we'll smother them out by adding mulch and not have to perhaps pull them all. Um, next phase, obviously, is do I need to spray, you know, and kind of pick in. Uh, picking the right spray for the for the right weed to take care of. Um, this time of year, it's it's hugely crucial that you get something done sooner than later. We always try to get this class kind of in that late February to late March time frame because <laughs> things are going to seed all over. You know, I always kind of joke with the the pop weed is popping right now. I know it's all over my yard. If you just walk by and touch that thing, a hundred seeds go flying in the air. And I had one, and now I got a hundred. And two weeks from now, now I got a thousand. So Try to get things done here, whether we pull them, spray them, mulch. We need to make a choice here pretty quick before these things go to seed and multiply very quickly. Um, you know, one big thing, and some, you know, if you can find information online, um, all of our counties and cities have a great noxious weed source available where you can see pictures, you can see things that 
absolutely need to be eradicated that don't belong here. They're invasive. They've come from other areas. You know, keep an eye out for that. You know, it's a great time of year. Where things have kind of breaking through the soil and starting out for 2022. You know, there's some things that you absolutely would want to get rid of before they have a chance to take over your property. So, so watch the noxious weed list a little bit. Um, and like I said, ask for help, you know, send a picture, bring a sample down. You know, we've got some pretty good staff here that if we don't know it off the top of our head, we can look on some resources and try to figure out what you are exactly fighting. And then again, get the appropriate solution for you so you've got success. No, we're not going to make this a vocabulary class, but I think there's going to be a couple words if we're talking about weed control that you really should understand. The labels are going to use them. We're going to use them. The internet's going to use them wherever you're looking. Um, you want to make sure you kind of understand the basic differences and your choices as a gardener on what to use. You know, first we would have these, this, these emergent type herbicides. So we have pre-emergent, which just means if you can guess, Maybe I've weeded an area, it's totally clean, or my beds are already clean because you're lucky. And I put down a pre-emergent herbicide that will dissolve on top of the soil and keeps things from germinating through it for a specified amount of time, depending on which product you choose. That may be an option to keep the area weed free by utilizing a pre-emergent like that. If we take something post-emergent. That means that weed is already grown. It's through the soil. I can see the leaves. It's probably getting ready to bloom. And I want to nuke that sucker. So we're going to get something post-emergent that I can apply as a spray and kill that weed from the top down to the root system, hopefully. So there's either one or or your choices for herbicides. There are some that are a combination of both. So we get some post-emergent death out of it and also cause them from regrowing. The one thing I would say, you know, as you're kind of wrapping your brain around this topic is, you know, think really carefully about pre-emergence. You know, that's one, maybe it's, maybe it's something you want to use for the, gra the gravel, a pathway, a driveway, you know, those kind of areas where maybe we don't have a lot of plants. I'd be real careful in the garden, vegetable garden, and typical garden situations, and the lawn, to be honest with you. Um, because if I put that down, no seeds are going to grow. So sometimes bulbs will struggle to get through a pre-emergent weed killer. Uh, lawn seed, if I put something on my lawn that I want to keep weeds from growing up, that's going to prevent my overseed from growing as well. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're, as you're making your choices. Some more fancy words for you. So the, the next two that we would classify, we would call selective weed killers or non-selective weed killers. And essentially that means exactly how it sounds. If I'm gonna choose a selective weed killer, that's gonna kill some plants, but not others. Non-selective will literally cause death to anything it touches. So we gotta be a little more careful with non-selective weed killers. You know, not to turn this into a botany lesson, but that, you know, really in the entire world, when it comes down to it, there's really two kinds of plants. If we talk from seed, we have what we call monocots, grasses, that when I germinate from a seed, I have one blade or one leaf and off we go. Everything else we call dicots, most all shrubs, perennials, trees, majority of things other than grass or dicots, which just means when I grow, I send two leaves up and I grow from there. It doesn't really matter except that to me is the main thing you gotta understand when, when you're choosing an herbicide. Selective ones will not kill monocots, but will kill all dicots. So that's why we would use something on our lawn that would kill dandelion, clover, the stuff we don't want, but it does not harm our grass. If I put a non-selective weed killer on my lawn, yes, I've gotten the dandelion and the clover, but I'm also gonna kill the turf. So be real careful when you pick your, pick your poison, so to speak, you know, again, some things natural, some things more chemical that we get the right, right, right thing for the right job. Now, you know, this is essentially going to be up to you. You know, you need to make your own choice as a gardener. You know, I have my house. I do what I want. You have yours. You can do what you want. Um, but consider your options is all I would ask. You know, there's some pretty good natural organic options um, for both non-selective um, and selective weed killers, um, post-emergent and pre-emergent. All four of those classifications, we can find a pretty good, useful, um, organic or natural option for that. Some will be sprays. Some will be granular. Um, certainly there's going to be some plants that are going to be a little tougher to, to nuke with something organic. Maybe we have to do it a few times, but eventually you would win on the majority of that. 
So again, getting your weed ID'd, maybe it's something woody, a blackberry, a shrub, whatever. I'm figuring out exactly what it is so that, again, we maybe try the right type organic or natural cure for that. You'll see a bunch, you know, on the internet. I've, I've been, I've read for all my lifetime, you know, vinegar and this, and you can go get a blowtorch if you're real careful not to get it near the wood, the foundation of the house. Um, there's, a, there's some very useful tools that you wouldn't have to spray at all. You know, sometimes, maybe speaking as a guy, it's kind of fun to throw the, the, the blowtorch on and walk around and, 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 and burn some weeds that you can physically hear sizzle in the gravel, the driveway, but just be real careful when we get to the landscape bed near the house, garage. Uh, there's plenty of uh, stories out there where someone has accidentally uh, burnt something down using a flamethrower for, for weed control. Uh, the other option is gonna be synthetic, chemical, systemic. You know, you kind of throw those things together, you know, not something that we would find naturally in nature, something man-made that is more chemical based that certainly are very effective. There's a lot of options out there. I'm not going to talk a lot today about brand names, trade names. You may be, you know, sending Nicole uh, chat questions on, well, what about Barrier and what about this? I'm not going to get into specific trade names. There is a, a, a brand name most companies have for every chemical. So we're going to talk about what we carry here at Sunnyside today. But if you look online, you can find the active ingredient and probably match that to a different brand that maybe is a little bit closer to you kind of thing. So, so look at the, the chemical synthetic, uh, you know, systemic options there. And again, there's post-emergent, pre-emergent um, uh, options for that as well. Now, if we talk about the lawn, you know, kind of the first area, um, you know, we all want nice, healthy green grass and we perhaps some of us don't mind some clover and some things growing in it. Um, but, you know, I, you know, for me, I'll speak for me again. I like my turf. I want it green. I don't want weeds. I want it tidy. Um, and I don't mind doing a little spot spraying. So that's what I use at my place right there. Captain Jack's Lawn Weed Brew used to be known as Weed Beater FE, which is a terrible name, except FE just means iron. It's a natural iron-based weed killer. You know, that's a great example of, you know, kind of using the right herbicide. Grass is able to absorb a massive amount of iron a broadleaf weed cannot. So if I walk along and spot spray here and there and kill that little dandelion, that pop weed, whatever it is, that's gonna die. The grass will turn a deep dark green, looks like little polka dots when you sprayed, but eventually the iron's out of the system. I'm right back to my nice emerald green color on my grass. Actively growing weed, I spray on it, it shrivels, it dies, and we move on. If we try corn gluten, that would be something that's a, a a pre-emergent. So if I have my lawn, I can throw corn gluten down as a totally organic option. It hits water, it rains, it dissolves, it makes a film on the soil, and it does work very well on lawns and landscape beds. I use it on both or have over the years. You got to be careful again with the pre-emergent, even though it's organic. If I use corn gluten, I've got about three months where I can't put grass seed down because that will not grow through the, the corn gluten either. Now, if we go synthetic or chemical options, you know, we've got a bunch of them. You know, we, we carry Bonide products here, which I think are the best ones on the market. Um, something like Weed Beater Ultra, you know, maybe you've used Weed Be Gone by Ortho. There's a lot of other similar products out there. This is a little bit different uh, formulation. The big thing for me is if you're going to go the chemical route, that's very effective on a huge number of weeds and it works in cooler weather. So maybe we get out there now and not have to wait for it to get 70 degrees consistently. We'd have great death using it a little bit earlier in the season and still having it be very effective. Sedgender would be the next phase. So if we wanted to try Sedgender, that would do pretty much everything that we beat or ultra does. But now I add on some grassy weeds, which is a little different. Sedges, some of the annual grasses, it suppresses buttercup some other things that Weed Beater Ultra might not do as good a job on. So that's kind of got a phase two in the chemical warfare. If you really want to go, okay, I got a lawn and I need to start over again. I've got buttercup, I got horsetail. You've got the worst ones on the planet in your yard. First, I apologize, I'm sorry. But if we want to get those out of there, now we get something like brush killer. And that sounds kind of, or why would I put that? Doesn't that nuke everything? That's a great high-end selective weed killer. That will not harm your, harm your turf at all, but that's going to take care of the really harsh 
heavier duty weeds like horsetail, buttercup, blackberries, um, anything woody like that as well. So that would be another option. If this is probably the only thing we carry here that is pre and post emergent, but you see right there, weed beater complete. So that's a granular product that's kind of like the, the herbicide part of the weed and feeds. But if I put that down on a turf, I only get a few bags of that for the, the OCD lawners that are even worse than I am um, and maybe don't mind some chemical use. Um, this is something that you would put down. It kills on contact weeds that are growing and it dissolves on the soil surface and we would have pre-emergent action as well. So again, no lawn seeding if you use Weed Beater Complete and that's just for the turf. We're not gonna put that in our landscape beds. I wanna make sure that's clear. Now you can see my last thing there, having said that, you know, I would ask you to, to consider not using weed feeds. I mean, that's a huge issue, I think, with the environment. Um, if you're gonna go the chemical route, it's not the end of the world, but I would rather have you get a really good product like Weed Beater Ultra, Sedge Ender, um, you know, even the Brush Killer, put it in a sprayer and walk around and spot spray where you need it instead of buying a bag of death and just broadcasting it over the entire lawn area. You know, A, you probably didn't need that much. It's easy, it's probably cheap. You say maybe it saves some time, uh, but I think spraying is not gonna take you long as you think it is. I mean, you're gonna do just the same job without using as much chemical in the yard, being a little bit more environmentally friendly, okay? Now, if we talk about herbicides for the landscape, you know, now we're away from the turf area, kind of more in our perennial beds, trees, shrubs, you know, all the early areas of our garden, including the vegetable garden. Um, you know, we, we've got some, some choices there as well. So if we want to go organic or natural, again, it's the same corn gluten. When I weed my beds before I compost, I will buy large bags of that and broadcast that out across all the beds. It doesn't hurt anything. And then put my compost or mulch over the top. That will keep me weed free for most of the growing season. I do it again in the fall. I'm good to, good to go for the winter. So it's always easy to pull a weed here and there when you've got fresh compost down. They pull out of the ground real early, not or real easily, not as much when, we, when we've got uh, just the harder soil underneath. The other option there you'll see again is that Captain Jack's Dead Weed, Dead weed Brew. It's got a new name. Uh, that's an all natural option, just caprylic acid, um, some different things again that are, that are that are found in nature to do a great job at killing non-selectively. I mean, this is going to damage broadleaves, grasses, everything, not just like the lawn. This would be a non-selective type. So something as an option for you, again, that I can walk around and do some spot spraying here and there, driveway, the cracks, the walkway, and landscape beds and the vegetable garden. But you got to be careful, non-selective. If you remember my definition means it, it's going to do damage to whatever it touches. So I really need to be careful in the garden, around perennials, vegetable seedlings, all that stuff will get damaged as well. So be real careful uh, how you spray and when you spray. We'll go through that in a little bit. Um, herbicides for the landscape, chemical options. Again, I'm looking at that brush killer. I think that's a really good option. There's lots of other brush killers on the market, different brands, but that BK32 uh, works very well especially when I get into some of the harder stuff, like up here, blackberry. I uh, would even probably win against bamboo and kutsu and some more invasive ones. Maybe I've got to do it twice if you've left those blackberries alone for a couple decades. Maybe we get it twice, but you will win uh, with the brush killer in the landscape. Again, really careful with the plants you want to keep, though, because that's another one that will damage all broadleaf plants, but it will not kill grasses, the same reason why we we put it in our in our turf, okay? So two tips there at the bottom. You know, I can't say enough. A lot of people come in here with the sad look on their face and say, yes, I sprayed my weeds. I wasn't really careful. I couldn't see that the spray had volatized and I've got burn on my peony, my perennial, my shrub, my azalea, the rest of it. Be really careful. Sometimes you can get a little piece of cardboard, you know, and kind of shove it down next to a shrub as you're spraying the weed next to it or, or a different kind of barrier. Um, is, is an option as well. Um, and again, if, if, I'm, if we're talking strictly about the vegetable garden, the berry patch underneath fruit trees, um, I would be extra careful to stick on the, the natural side. Don't maybe try the chemical route, especially in the vegetable garden. We want to try something that's natural. Um, it's not going to get into anything that we eat as well.
So here's a bunch of general advice, and then I'm going to show you a few pictures of some of the, the peskiest ones that we see up here. Um, you know, A, again, always use your products as directed, whether they're organic or synthetic. It doesn't matter. Read the label. Use it the way it's supposed to be used. You know, they're going to tell you how to do it right the first time and hopefully, again, save you time and money as you go on. We want to get it on once, have it do its job, and move on to the next garden project. Um, if it was me, I would always have a sprayer marked with a Sharpie, a label, whatever your thing is that says herbicide. I would not mix spray from fertilizer to herbicide. And I don't want to have two. I'll just rinse it out. Yes, you may be okay. Um, I would personally not take a chance of having any residue in there, especially with the chemical herbicides that you go mix your nice fertilizer in and go spray that out. Then we get some herbicide in there and we do some damage to wherever we spray it as well. So I would always have a second tank sprayer, Ozen sprayer, whatever your, your application way is, uh, marked for herbicide use. Second one we can use for the, for the good stuff in the garden. You know, if you look at that fancy word there, turbo, you know, consider using something like turbo. There's a lot of different options for these surfactants. Some people call them spreader stickers. Essentially, it's a glue. It's going to help you add it to an herbicide or any spray for that matter. And if I spray my weed, that's gonna help burn the cell wall and get that active ingredient into the plant much easier. Maybe it's a plant like clover is one a lot of people struggle with. You know, clover's got a little waxy, you know, kind of pubescent leaf that it's hard to get a liquid to sit on there and actually burn it. Clover's a very hard one with most herbicides. If I get something like turbo, that's going to help that break down and glue it to that foliage. So I'm going to have, again, much better luck, a little less time, a little less money um, using the spray because I'm going to have that glue that's going to make it more effective, okay? Now, timing is everything. You know, I, I wish I had my crystal ball and I'd rub it here and say, yes, we're going to have last frost on this day. And yes, it's going to be 70 degrees on this day. You know, who knows what the weather does up in our little climate up here. Um, you need to watch the weather and see, is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? Is it going to be warm enough? We're not going to have great luck spraying a lot of these herbicides, whether they're natural or organic, in the de dead of winter. It's just nothing's actively growing. Nothing's going to go to the root system. We have to wait for the garden to wake up in the spring. And then again, I always do this in the fall as well before we kind of put the garden to bed. So if we wait now, I think we're all warm enough. You know, I don't see should knock on wood here that we have any more frost coming or we'd have a lot of unhappy plants here at the nursery. Um, but it's warm enough now that all the products I'm mentioning, we could go out and get started. Spring is a perfect time as plants are actively growing. Everything right now is throwing out leaves, maximum flow um, of circulation between top and root system. So when I get an herbicide on, I'm gonna get quick death and I'm gonna get the root because it is actively growing and, and moving on here in the season, okay? So watch the timing. The weather's, the, the wet part of it is really hard because if you know, as I smile, the, the weather the weather person up here is not nearly correct as much as they should be. So, you know, wait till the morning. It's like, okay, it's not going to rain today. Again, if you read your label, it's going to tell you on there, you know, rain fast in one hour, rain fast in four hours. As long as we can get it applied, let it get soak in, before it rains, then we're going to have great effectiveness. Well, like I mentioned, get a head start in spring. You know, I would get out and start spraying as early as possible. We'll see a picture of the, the notorious pop weed here coming up on our little slideshow. Um, you know, that's one everybody fights. When the, when the weather warms, this goes back six weeks ago, pop weed's already popping. <clears throat> if I let those go to seed, I'm going to have a bazillion of them here pretty quickly. And that's not just that weed, it's every weed. So get them done. You know, if, if we were to make kind of a, a definition of a weed, of course, half of it's, you know, one man's trash, another one's treasure. Some people like weeds, which is fine. Dandelion salad is a favorite one around here. Um, but if you want to keep them to a minimum, if I'm a weed, I'm going to reproduce myself as fast as possible. That is what I am. I want one and I want 10 and I want 100 as soon as I can. So get it early before they go to seed and you will not have as much work long term. <coughs> Excuse me. A big one uh, for me, because this, speaking as a retailer, you know, for 30 years here, that next one, maximized foliage absorption, 
that is a huge one that I get questions on because I'll tell you, most gardeners, say you're fighting blackberry or something that's that's woody, it's big, you're tired of it, you want to get it off the bank, wherever it is. You know, the worst thing you can do is go out, cut it all back, and then come into the store and say, hey, I'd like to get a spray to nuke my blackberries. Great, I got that, but now you got to wait for them to regrow so that we have a whole bunch of foliage that I can get that spray on that will soak in and kill the root system. So I want as much leaves as I can. You know, if you've got a, a blackberry forest, we'll call it, that's out of control, yes, go ahead and maybe cut it in half. Wait a week. You're going to have plenty of leaves left that I can get in there and put some nuclear death on that to get it to, to get it to die. But I want leaves to get the most ingredient into my plant that I'm trying to kill to get it to get it knocked down. So don't go prune whatever it is you're trying to kill before you spray it. There's an e easy way to put it, okay? Another one, the big one for me is that next one there, brushing versus spraying. A lot of people like me, I've got an established garden. I love all my plants. I'm not interested in accidentally nuking any of them, even with my safe organic options that I use. You know, I need to be careful in there. So there's sometimes in the growing season, you know, it's like, okay, I'm not going to be able to physically get in here and spray that weed because I've got a peony, I've got this, I've got that, and I'm going to get it on those plants really no matter what I do. Okay, let's, let's get a little paint can or a little tin, mix some of that uh, herbicide that you're using, appropriate dilution, and that, get a little paintbrush, and I could walk around the yard and dab some of that on the plants that I want to kill or brush the stems of horsetail, you know, that's coming up all over the place in a certain bed. That will get enough of that on there where, yes, it will get to the root and hopefully do the job. Maybe I watch those areas and go back and brush a little more on if I don't get enough. But that would be a safe option as well in lieu of using a sprayer. The human eye can't see all the mist and the volatilization that occurs when you spray something like that. If you're just going, oh, yeah, daydreaming and kind of looking at the stars and the clouds while you're doing it, you're going to end up getting the weed and that overspray is going to go up and get on those neighboring plants a little bit easier than you probably think it will, okay? So yet even more advice, there's a few more. So, you know, reapply herbicides as needed. You know, I would always go back and check an area that you sprayed. You know, you, you'll see pretty quick shriveling and contortion and brown and black and all the fun things that we wanna see uh, when the weeds die or the blackberry, whatever it is. We'll see it happen pretty quick. But monitor that area, you know, go back in a couple weeks and say, okay, nothing has grown. Two weeks later, oh, I see just a little bit coming off a root that I didn't quite get enough on, nuke it again, and then you'll win. Um, don't just spray the property line and walk away for eight months and come back and say, whoa, I thought I killed everything. I got a couple things still growing. Again, we can take care of them really quickly uh, by reapplying in a, in a short time. You know, get the right tool for the right job. You know, I brought a few things in here. If anybody asks me about some good weeding tools, I'll show you at that during the question part. Um, but there's some great little hand tools. There's long hander tools if you don't want to bend over as much. You know, I kind of like the kneeling pad myself and get up and personal and get those little suckers out of there as best I can with my trowel. But there's hula hose, a hori hori knife. You know, there's a there's Cape Cod weeders. There's a bunch of little useful devices depending on, you know, probably your physical nature. Do you want to stand up? Do you want to kneel down? You know, do you want something that's a little lighter? Do you want to drag or do you want to, you know, dig in the soil? You know, it's kind of more up to you depending on the, the type of tool we choose for that as well. You know, you'll see me mulch. You know, mulch to me is a great way to kind of kill two birds with one stone, as they say. I want weed control suppression by putting three or four inches of mulch down. I'm also going to make my garden happy. I'm going to conserve moisture. I'm going to add nutrition, particularly when I use compost for that purpose. Um, it's going to do my, my soil and my garden a great amount of good, as well as uh, suppress those weeds. You know, I don't ever put weed fabric on here. You know, that's certainly an option of something we do not carry at our place. Um, you can find that at the chain stores and probably online. Um, there's a number of weed fabrics that, yeah, they probably work really well. You know, purportedly, they're going to let moisture through and moisture out. And you can cut slits in it and put your shrubs and perennials in. And you can cover with mulch. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that either. My advice would be, you know, think very carefully where you're going to put weed fabric down. It's a pain to remove down the road. Um, and two, pick your quality right. If you've got a back 40, an area that you're graveling, somewhere you don't want to deal with weeds, 
that might be a great option to put down there to give you a barrier. Um, but I'm going to get the high-end weed fabric. I'm not going to get the cheap $10 roll. I'm going to buy the $30 roll because you'll see those listed as five-year, 10-year, 30-year kind of things. You're not going to want to go redo this all the time. So if you truly are going to do weed fabric and try to suppress an area, um, get the longer term weed fabric. That might be a, a better service to you. Um, last thing now, you know, is cut things down. You know, I was talking to a lady just yesterday that had a tree removed and she was happy to see her uh, thorny locust tree go that was way too big for her backyard. So I immediately said, all right, well, I'm glad it's gone. Did you get the stump round or did you apply a stump killer to it? Well, why would I do that? And there's a lot of plants, if you don't do one of those two things, you're going to have a bazillion suckers come off the root system, the trunk you left, even the base of it, if that's all there is. Um, you're going to have a mess with a lot of plants. So make sure if you cut down a tree like that, that we go back, ask what it is, send us a picture, you know, ask somebody who knows what kind of tree it was and do we have a chance of that thing trying to regrow off the root system. Maybe it's got to come out, maybe we can grind it, but we could certainly get our power drill, put a bunch of Swiss cheese holes in the top of that trunk and get some stump killer to pour in there to speed up the degradation and, and kill that plant once and for all, okay? Now, if we look at, we're doing our time here. We're doing, yes, Nicole, we're doing great today. So if we look at some pictures real quick, you know, these are just some things that some I found online, most of these I've seen in my yard, but just to kind of give you a few, um, you know, you can always look, there's great websites. Again, our cities, our counties, our states will have great pictures of a lot of the common things we would see right in our local location. Um, things that are invasive, things that don't belong here, all the things that we've kind of talked about today. Um, you know, these are a few of the particularly pesky ones that I tend to fight over the years in, in my own yard. And, and, I, and I have a kind of a native bank that, that's next to my place that I try to keep clean as well. So uh, bed straw is one. Uh, that you will see kind of climb and cling. It's sticky. It gets those little sticky kind of prickly seed pods on it. If you had bed straw that you wait, let, let alone, it'll kind of grow like a vine and cover everything. You walk by it and you probably got about 20 of the seeds will stick to your arm, your clothes, um, and then you just take it somewhere else. That's the way it's kind of going to propagate itself. But bed straw is one I'd I'd get a spray on pretty early and try to get it out of there. You don't want to have that thing crawling in amongst all your plants. It starts with one. It'll look like you got a whole patch of it. If you can find it, you can probably just pull the, the root system out that all of it's coming from because it's one that does uh, spread pretty quickly here in springtime. We looked at plantain. Probably everybody's seen that little guy growing out of their driveway crack or anywhere in the garden. Um, you know, that one's not too bad to pull. Um, again, it can, any of the sprays we've talked about today would take care of and most of these things here. Um, but that's one, again, I put, took the picture with the flowers on it because that's, again, the problem to me is the little rosettes of the foliage are coming up right now. Let's get it sprayed and get it done with or get it dug out before all those little seed heads go and you've got about 100 more going on that same area. Buttercup, you know, that's probably one everyone's like put their head down and they're starting to shake it now. Yeah, 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 buttercup, it never ends. Uh, buttercup's a tough one. You know, I'll be honest, that's one that propagates itself. Underground rhizomes, another clump, another clump, another clump. If you've got wet soil, especially in the wintertime up here, probably on the heavier clay side, the buttercup is never going to end. If you leave it alone, it's just going to keep coming and coming and coming. Um, I talked to a lot of folks out here near us that have maybe a little more property, Snohomish, you know, east of us a bit that maybe have a pasture that they don't mind being a pasture and they've got their lawn, they'd like to keep a little nicer uh, by the house. You know, that's one you've got to somehow get a line between the two because if you leave the buttercup, it's just going to continue to creep into the lawn area um, and the flower beds as well. Um, you know, I pulled it before. If you get a good sharp trowel and you do some work, you can pull it out physically. I think most people that are probably at the class here that have buttercup are like, I got way too much. I'm not going to spend a week crawling around and pulling this out of everywhere in my yard. You know, get me a spray. Um, this is a little tougher one to kill. We, we don't, not going to have as good a luck with, you know, maybe some of the milder herbicides on buttercup. Um, some things work very well as suppression. If you've pulled it, you can keep it out. But I think you're, you know, the easiest one with this, especially in the lawn, is to get that brush killer, uh, the BK32 
spray that buttercup. It'll nuke the buttercup and won't hurt your grass. If it's in the beds, be really careful. Consider brushing it on because a lot of times this is a flat little creeping ground cover. It's going to be hard um, to, to spray that and not get it on the shrubs, the perennials, and the things that are around it. Old dandelion, you know, we, everybody loves dandelions. I got two little boys and they love picking the flowers that come up and blowing the seeds all over the yard. That's always an easy way they get dispersed by wind. Um, dandelions, one, they come in all shapes and sizes. There's a number of different species of dandelions. It's all the same trick. If I let those umbels of flowers come up, develop into a seed, little breeze is going to disperse that seed all over the place. Um, so I would, again, recommend getting these done early. This is an easy one to spray. You can use the natural products in the lawn, like the lawn weed brew is great with butt dandelion and the landscape bed, same thing. You can use something a little more natural if you like. Um, that's an easy, easy one to kill. Uh, the English ivy, you know, the not American ivy. Notice I wrote English ivy because that does not belong here. Um, I haven't sold ivy for years, anybody in the landscape. I hope nobody buys ivy anymore. Um, it is a brutal invasive weed that is on the noxious weed list uh, for all of our locations these days. It chokes out our forest and it does not belong in the yard. I know some people are going to be mad at me for saying that because they like their ivy green little bank hanging over the brick wall, but it's a tough one to tame. You know, it's a woody invasive plant that will never stop until you dig it out, spray it or chop it and it's going to run with the root system too. So this is a hard one to kill. Um, I'm not going to spray it if it's up on tree trunks. You'll do, do damage to your tree. So you, a lot of times you would cut at the base of the tree and sever all of those branches that have grown up and clung into the bark and try to pull that off physically. On the ground level, yes, we would spray. I don't think you're going to have any luck of uh, killing ivy with anything uh, natural, organic style. You're going to have to go to a brush killer. Make sure you use the turbo or the adhesive that we talked about earlier, because ivy's got a really green waxy foliage, that liquid is gonna run off most of the time. We need something to glue that to the ivy so we get death with, with one good spray, okay? Um, this is one, I'll be honest, I mean, I, a lot of people try to pull it, um, you know, more power to you if you wanna try to dig it out. I have done many times in my life, but you really have to dig it out. Don't think chopping this off at the ground is gonna change your situation at all. We got to get the root system out of there, and the root system is going to be uh, fairly extensive if it's been there for a while. So um, I monitor mine. I had it on a bank when we bought our house. It's never made it into my yard. I have sprayed a little bit on the property next door, the city bank, uh, to keep it from coming in. And I watch because a lot of mature ivy is going to get fruits on it. The birds will eat it, and they will be kind enough to drop little ivy seedlings around your landscape on occasion. Watch it in this time of year. If you see one growing out of the soil, it's very easy to pull out of there before it develops any root system at all. Uh, fire weeds, another one, noxious weed. Uh, one of my neighbors at my fine neighborhood never it's kind enough to leave her entire bank covered with fire weed these days. Um, I've offered to try to spray it for her. She's declined. She likes the flower on it. Uh, but this is another one that if it blows in the wind, you're going to have fireweed everywhere. This is one that will take over large areas. Um, it is pretty when it flowers, but it's not so pretty when you uh, have a bazillion of them growing. So that's another one. Most herbicides will, will take care of, of, of the fireweed, whether they're chemical, synthetic, um, or the natural side. Uh, blackberry, blackberries and more blackberries. You know, that's another one I think... Um, you know, being native to up here, this is not our native blackberry. This is Himalayan blackberry that takes over most of our areas. It doesn't belong here. It's the same thing. Um, yes, we get some delicious berries off them. That, that doesn't change. They're a little smaller. They're not the things we would buy at the, at the nursery to plant for, for gourmet blackberries. But they certainly produce. Um, I know a lot of people walk around and pick them. That's fine, too. But if these are in your yard, um, blackberry will take over your whole landscape. If you let it go, it's going to grow by root. It's going to arch a cane over, it's going to hit the ground, it's going to root again, and it's just going to make a thicket or bramble. Um, I would recommend getting on this sooner than later if you do not want them growing because they will never stop. This is one I fight. Uh, my yard is nice and secure. I've, I've uh, made the line of demarcation. You're not going to cross here anymore. 
but having a bank on three sides that is city property and not mine, that's not managed, um, they don't do any spraying. You know, I do go out there, I do mix a chemical in that case, because you're not going to get a blackberry with something organic. Um, and I do paint that on and try to nuke that out of my bank because I do not want that rooting and coming through my fence line into my yard because uh, it has many times. So try brush killer again. This is one, if you look online, you'll probably find some more natural ideas like vinegar. Um, there's some other things you can mix up and try to burn it. Um, the chemical will get it. The other stuff I'll tell you from experience, you're gonna probably have to do it two, three, sometimes four times to make sure you get the root system as well. A uh, horse tail is probably the other uh, most evil creature that most people come in here and ask about. A little paintbrush feathered plant, they got kind of a wiry stem. Uh, the root system for these is honestly halfway to China through the globe, but this one goes down a long ways with root. This is not one you're gonna be able to pull. Um, if you're going to dig it out, you're going to be digging out a large hole to get all of the root system out of there. If you nip it off, three of them will come back. So pulling it's probably not the answer. Uh, this is one I'm knocking on wood. You can't see me that I've been lucky enough not to have uh, take over in my yard at all, but it's something I watch for every year. Um, if you have it, you're going to have to get a, a chemical type herbicide to control that. And I would recommend painting it on. If it's in my lawn, something like the brush killer will do the job. It's, it's indicative that you have moisture in the soil. It's not the end of the world, but typically, again, people that are a little bit more wet in the wintertime, maybe don't drain as well, are going to be prime spots to have horse, horse tail growing. Uh, this is another one that multiplies very quickly, makes a patch. So I would say spray in the lawn with something like the brush killer or the BK32, um, or if we're out in the property, we can use a non-selective herbicide um, like that because I don't, and maybe paint it on if it's in garden beds. This is the perfect example of one. I can really paint those little spears as they come out of the soil here in spring, get that, get that chemical to the root system and try to kill the roots and all and not have them come back. You know, in, in all brutal honesty, this is one you're gonna have to declare war on. You're going to start with one spray and you're going to go back and probably do it again. You might have to do it again after that. You're not going to win as easily against the horsetail. Uh, lamium, you know, these creeping nettles, um, you know, I, I see these a little bit in my lawn on occasion. Um, probably the birds nice enough to leave me a seed here and there. Um, they're easy to pull out. It's just one to keep an eye out. Some people buy lamium as a shady ground cover. It's not the same you know, weedy variety that you would see in the garden. But all lamiums by nature are kind of shady, part shady ground covers. They're gonna to wanna to take off um, and do a creep and kind of get you more. So again, before they bloom, if you don't want this, uh, get it sprayed. This would be one we would have good luck with, with the natural side. Honestly, it's a very easy one to kill that way um, or go the chemical route. Uh, Morning Glory is another one. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have morning glory, yes, they have pretty flowers, uh, but yes, they will also take over whatever you let them take over. So this is one with an extensive underground root system. It's all interconnected. Um, another one I don't think you're going to have the best luck digging out. You're going to have to do it over and over again to get all the little root pieces out of the soil. Uh, this is one I'd really recommend going to a spray of some kind. Um, could be chemical. I, I've done the organic option. It has helped. Um, I don't think it's eradicated it. This is another one I fight from coming off the bank outside my garden, through the fence, under or underground, and popping up in some of my gardens on the fence line. So that's one I'll watch for quite a bit here in the spring and make sure that it doesn't get a foothold. A nightshade's another one, a vining, creeping plant that is poisonous. Uh, these got awful pretty flowers. They look like they're in the potato family, um, but they also have poisonous fruits on there. You'll see nightshade with those clusters of berries on there that are not good for us, for kids or, or pets or wildlife. So watch the nightshade. That's another one. It's vining and gets going pretty quickly. I can, I can get that uh, certainly with the, with the brush killer. Uh, geraniums are one. This is a tough one because some of the wild geraniums around here are, are awful pretty, but there's a lot of geraniums. You'll see if you look on a noxious weed list that don't belong here, that are noxious weeds and will choke out 
a lot of the native plants that we do want to thrive in our natural environments or in our gardens for that matter. Um, so watch for these wild geraniums. This is another one with a lot of root system that creeps underground very well, especially in those kind of shady, you know, kind of mulched areas. Um, you'll see these popping up quite a bit. Uh, this is another easy one to get in the spring. Don't let it get a foothold. If we can get an herbicide on that, whether it's natural uh, or chemical, we'll get pretty good, pretty good luck killing those um, those weedy type geraniums. Uh, and there's one, another one I have a personal battle with the Mr. Oxalis. Um, this is a really tight little creeping one. Again, underground stems. It's flat to the ground. It can be green. It can be red. It's kind of, I kind of fight my brain with it because it does look kind of pretty when it grows in the rocks and here and there. It's kind of hard to say, yeah, be okay with a little bit of that if you just did keep going because that's the problem with oxalis. <clears throat> it keeps going with root system. And those little pretty yellow flowers are followed by a little seed capsule. You're probably smiling if you've fought oxalis. You can go out there and pull it out of the ground or dig out the tap root and get rid of it. But boy, you let those things go to seed, you touch it and you can hear the seeds explode. And now I can guarantee you're gonna have a hundred of them coming up here pretty quick. Uh, this is one I'm on a nonstop battle with in my little OCD gravel parking pad that I park my truck on. I, every year, I think I got the last few dug out and I'm done. I was out last week and there's 50 of them just starting to grow out of the gravel here and there again. So. <laughs> the war will be back on between me and Mr. Oxalis here in the next coming weeks. I will try to dig it out again as well. Uh, this is a really hard one to spray. I'm going to be honest with you, whether it's in the lawn or in the gravel or the landscape bed, um, because it's got that clovery, waxy leaf, not a lot of products are going to stick to that. You've got to use the turbo, whether it's something you know, synthetic or organic, get that spreader sticker on there so that it will stick to those leaves, uh, penetrate the tissue and get the death. If you will walk around and spray <coughs> with any of those types of herbicides without the turbo spreader sticker, I can guarantee the majority of it's just gonna sit there, beat up and roll off the leaves and it will not get in and uh, do the job. Sorrel. Sorrel is another one <coughs> for me that tends to creep off the uh, native banks next to my place. This is a little flat guy. You'll see kind of taller tan colored seed heads come out of that here as we go through the season. The problem with sorrel, <coughs> if I stuck a shovel underneath that clump and pulled it up, I'm gonna see rubbery kind of reddish brown fibrous roots going everywhere. It has a mother plant, <coughs> excuse me, and then it just continues to grow just under the soil level and just keep popping up foliage all over the place. So this is another one. If you start early here, you know, we could probably spray that with, again, chemical works well or the organic side and get death of that. I would recommend doing it here pretty quickly in spring before it has a chance to develop those seed heads, get larger roots and get a foothold because now we're going to have to probably uh, work on it a few times to get it eradicated. There's the, <coughs> excuse me, the shot weed or the pop weed. You know, that's the one that's the, the curse of most areas around here. That one started out quite a few weeks ago. Pretty little white flower uh, when it blooms, but then that little seed head comes out. Even if you go to pull it with the seed head, again, you'll hear that pop sound. There goes a whole bunch of seeds back into the soil. Might take a while for them to get down to their right depth and you're gonna have a hundred of more of them grow. This is a really easy one to pull, you know, or use a little tool like a hula hoe because I don't have to big tap root. I don't have to get down deep into the soil to pull those out. I can rake them off almost, or I can, you know, physically dig them up and not take half the soil in the garden with me. That's a pretty easy one to pull, but just get out and pull it or spray it here pretty quick before it gets going. It's not one that you would have to get, you know, a high-end chemical spray to kill it all. This one would have great death in the lawn with the lawn weed brew uh, or the dead weed brew out in the garden. A speedwell, same thing, more of a lawn thing. Sometimes you'll see these, um, you know, growing in the landscape beds as well. Really easy one to pull out, um, not, not super deep rooted, kind of like the popweed. Um, it's got a pretty little blue flower. Sometimes I like it in the lawn, but 
I don't want it taking over the lawn. So I sometimes will watch it bloom and go, Ooh, that's pretty. And then I'll go back and get it in a couple of days. Um, it's one we can spray. Any of the natural stuff works very well, as well as the, the chemical side. Um, and Mr. Thistle, you know, whether it's Canadian thistle, Western thistle, there's a whole bunch of thistles around here. Yes, we probably want to put a little body armor on, kind of like the blackberries, if we're going to get in there and work on this. They're pokey, they're prickly, um, they're not, not too gentle on the skin. Um, and again, the key is getting them before they go to seed. The problem with thistle, um, and it's kind of like the blackberry and a few things we've talked about, is the underground part of it. A lot of root system spreads that way, goes to seed, you get more plants. You know, I've seen pat patches of thistle where you've just got to spray. You know, I don't know that you're going to have the best of luck digging this up unless you can find one here, one there, and get them before they colonize and make a large patch of it. Um, you could certainly pull them. Um, this is one we could we could have easy death with spray as well. Uh, and then the vetch, you know, this is another one I fight a little bit because uh, I like vetch. It's kind of a fun plant. It's useful as a cover crop in the vegetable garden. The problem is the next spring, uh, if the seeds are still there and how, how it takes off because vetch is one that'll grow very rapidly. It's kind of viney. It'll wrap itself around anything. It'll hug the ground. It'll pull out shrubs. It'll climb up a stem. You know, vetch will go anywhere. Um, it is very pretty, the flower, and it's, it's a cool looking plant, but it's one that I try to keep Again, off the main part of the garden, maybe you can have you have at the, the bank at my house. I'm fine with that. Um, but it's one you don't want to let, let get going too crazy. It's one, again, it, it, it looks like a lot if you have vetch, but if you can kind of feel your way in there and pull the stems up, you have one big clump usually that just vines and twines and runs everywhere. So if you can get in there and pull it, it's very easy to pull. Um, if you can get the root, don't just snip it off of the ground or you're going to have more coming. Um, it's certainly one that we can spray uh, either way with something that's that's more natural side um, or or um, something chemical as well. There's Mr. Clover, <clears throat> red clover, micro clover, white clover. I'm not gonna I'm gonna offend half the people because I think clover is a cool looking plant too. But you know I don't want it in my lawn. You know I don't mind a clump of it here and there that keeps the bees happy. Um, and it's a great nitrogen fixer. If you have a lot of clover in your lawn, maybe. Some fertilizer might help too because it's probably there and happy because you need it to fix nitrogen in your soil. Um, but it's a clumpy, it's a runny. The problem with clover is the leaves. You know, again, with something waxy with a little bit of hair on, it's very hard to get a spray to stick to that clover. This is another one I would absolutely use a good, <clears throat> a good quality herbicide and make sure that it's got the turbo, the, the, the spreader sticker involved as well. And um, then wild carrots, you know, that's one I found a few of those at my house last year. These are kind of cool, actually, and it is some kind of a wild carrot. It's not one we're going to pull up and eat, uh, but it's in the carrot family. But again, the reason I put that on there, this one a dandelion, probably examples of the tap root. So again, if, if I, I'll smile when I say if you've had that dandelion growing for about five years, you know, and I want to spray it or pull it, you've probably got an actual carrot-sized tap root underneath the ground there. So we're probably going to have to spray it a couple times if it's been left alone. Um, or if we're going to dig it, we're going to have to dig it. We're not going to chop it off because that root will just take back off and we'll have some, some freebies that come right back out afterwards. So, you know, watch for things like that, the dandelion that maybe have a little bigger tap root that we can attack, uh, attack that way as well. So there's enough slides for you. Hopefully you got a few weeds. That's not even close to the amount of weeds we could probably go out and find in my yard or your yard at any time of the year. But there's some of the more common ones that I hear about here at the nursery. Um, you can see our website on there. Uh, you can always find the class out on there. Again, the classes are all recorded. You go back and touch up on weed control if you want here later. This will be on the website later today. And there's our email. You know, if you want to email a picture, a question, you know, I love samples. You know, sometimes I can tell from a picture, I can blow it up, great. Sometimes you might say, hey, bring one of those down here. I can't quite tell what it is, and we can get you a proper di diagnosis that way as well, okay? I'm going to stop the share here. <clears throat> we're just going to say, you know, with all the classes we do at Sunnyside here, I forgot to say, we brought one pine tree in here today. Doesn't that look pretty behind me instead of just a plastic wall? One of these days, I'll make a garden back there look nice. Um, but if you, you know, watch the class discount because it's a good time to take advantage of sale again when we try to hopefully teach you some success of these classes, get you to come down 
um, and spend some of your hard-earned money on some of the good products here that will be beneficial for these subjects. So we control all the products, whether they're synthetic, organic, pre-emergent, emergent, all those fun words we talked about at the beginning. All that's on special starting today through Friday, 20% off. So you can come down and take advantage of that, uh, hopefully here in the coming days. Um, I'll be back here in two weeks. Um, I'm on weekend duty, so I'm here next weekend if you want to come down and chat anyway. But I, we're not doing classes next weekend. Uh, the weekend after, the 9th and 10th, again, a couple of my favorites, Japanese maples I'll be doing on Saturday the 9th at 10 a.m. And Sunday uh, the 10th at 11 is Colorful Shrubs. And that's kind of a fun class to me because we do, you know, specific classes, hydrangeas and mazalias and roadies and all these specific shrub classes. This would be a fun one if you're, okay, I got all that. I'm looking for something different. So we'll kind of go through a lot of cool spring blooming, foliage color, uh, even some fall stuff, uh, some good shrub options that maybe you don't see everywhere that would be beneficial to add into the landscape as well, okay? So let's see how we're doing on questions, Miss Nicole. We got some good ones? Yeah, there's been a lot of good questions. Um, you covered quite a bit, a good range of stuff. So I think we caught most of them, but we've got some questions specifically, um, like what about grasses that grow under your trees that you don't yeah. want to get? What product do you yeah. recommend for that? Well, again, if, if we've got grasses, we have to go to a non-selective type herbicide, something that will kill broadleaf and grass. We're not going to get it on the trunk or the foliage of that fruit tree. But if I've got something like that natural side, that Captain Jack's dead weed, dead weed brew. If I got that, I even bought a bottle in here. I can show you some stuff. That little guy right there. And this one actually comes with a little battery sprayer on it, which is cool. So we concentrate or, or in the sprayer form. If I put that down, I'm not, that's again, the natural stuff. That's just caprylic acid. It's not going to hurt my fruit tree as long as I don't get it on the bark or the leaves, <clears throat> but it would kill both weeds and grass at the base. Okay, good to know. Speaking of stuff you brought in there, did you happen to bring any tools? Some of those tools we took about? Oh, I show did. And tell? I'll show, show and tell here. Yeah. So here is our hula hoe. We say this is the hoe that wiggles. You can see the end of it gives a little play, but I could drag this across my soil. Now this is the short version. I'm going to be down on my kneeling pad doing a little scraping of pop weed and some of those easy things. We've got the long handle one too. So if you'd rather stand and do it that way. You know, Hulu Hill makes a great tool. Um, I think the Cape Cod weeder is pretty handy. We have a few of those around. That's something I can get at the soil and kind of do this, the same thing from a hand level. I've always got a hoary hoary knife on my holster with my pruners. This one looks like a kind of a bad weapon. This is pretty sharp, be careful with it. But this is one I can easily just pop in and, and, and get some of those maybe ones that are a little bit deeper. That'll go right in the soil. I could pop that dandelion right out or, or a small weed as well. So I brought all kinds of goodies in here. Here's a little narrow one. We call this the dandelion weeder. So the same thing. I want more of a trowel that I can dig in and pop something out. This will get down there. I hope your dandelion tap roots are not longer than that. But that'll get down there quite a ways and, and pop some of those out. I think these are pretty useful. I love radius tools. We carry their shovels, some of their hand tools. Again, be real careful. <laughs> That's pretty sharp. This is very sharp at the bottom, but I can really, again, get into there and maybe get some tougher things to get out with something like the radius. This is called a soil knife. Uh, we carry that in the store as well, too. There's a couple show and tell, see? I'll, well, tell, my so I'll tell my seven year old tonight that I got to do show and tell today. He'll be, he'll cool. be pretty psyched. He'll be very proud. Um, <laughs> so is the Hori Hori knife your go to? I mean, what, what do you think is your favorite? What do you always have with you? I, I use a hula hoe quite a bit, to be honest with you. And again, I'm I'm getting up there, but I'm not old enough that I don't mind crawling around. I like getting up and close on the kneeling pad for me. So I usually go more hand tool than the long handle. Um, it's totally up to you. Sometimes the back doesn't let you do that or the knees get a little tired. Mine are getting there, not quite yet. But um, so I like the trowel. If I pick the two things I use the most common, it's probably my Hori Hori knife. I use that for a lot of stuff, popping bulbs in, weeding. Um, I hate to say my pruner blade sometimes makes it quick and easy, like, oh, I get you with the tip of my pruner. Um, but if I had one, it would probably be the hula hoe for me. 
Good to know. You know, a body in motion stays in motion, right? Gardening keeps you young, both body and stop, spirit. Stop creaking and cracking, and that's a good way to get it started for the day. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, so speaking of these tools, is there any uh, thing we should know, any things we should know about cleaning them, taking care of them, yeah. you know, kind of go to stuff? Well, you know, I'll, you know, you, you know, I don't know that I've ever sterilized my weeding devices, to be honest with you. I'm more worried about that with the pruning end of things because I'm digging into tissue of something I'm keeping before I go touch something else. Uh, so I would sterilize pruners. I've, I've never had to ster I've never sterilized a weeder in my life, sharpened them absolutely. Uh, depending on what tool it is, it's really easy to get a sharpening stone or we have a couple sharpening devices here that I can run along the edge of my trowel, all these different things I showed you. A little bit sharper is always going to be a little easier to get to the soil that way. Yeah, less work for you, right? Which we always yep. like. <laughs> um, we were talking about horsetail. Do you yep. want to use that turbo on that? Would that help at all? <clears throat> you know, look, let me just say this, you know, because again, I, I I try to always ride the high road here and tell you to use everything natural. You can do it for most of it. You, you're, you're not going to win with horsetail unless you go to a chemical. And if I had to go to a chemical, I want to use as less as possible and I want it to work. I am absolutely getting that turbo spreader sticker on anything that I've got like that because I want to put that chemical on. I want it to stick to it. I want it to soak in and nuke that thing down to the root system. Um, that's the poster child for probably having to do it even with the harshest chemical there is you're probably still okay I got almost all of it I'm looking good a month later okay here comes a couple more get them early get them when they're young and you'll win because then we get the root system out of there that is not one like I said you're going to be able to probably hand pull quite as easy all right good to know um questions about bluebells came up what do you do yep. uh, to get rid of those oh the bluebells yes um, you know, that's a tough one because I, some people love bluebells, other ones you probably planted a couple and now you got 500 of them. So we, we would call that a little bulb that naturalizes, you know, one that we put a few in because you want a whole carpet of them down the road. Uh, the squirrel will move them around for you. That's what happens at my house. I didn't even plant any and I keep planting more and more every year. Um, it, you know, again, this is the time of year when I've got foliage up on that bulb. If I want to kill the actual bulb on something like bluebells or scylla, there's a lot of plants people call bluebells. I'm assuming they're talking about scylla, a little bulb. Um, that's something that I could spray herbicide on the leaves. I've got to do it here in spring to get it to get to the bulb and, and kill that little creature. If I wait too long in the spring, um, anything grows from a bulb or a corn like that's going to shut down as we get towards May into June. That's going to want to go dormant. The leaves are yellowing. We're not transferring, again, nutrients from bulb to, to stem to flower. So get that early because then you'll get it in there and actually kill the bulb out. Got it. I, uh, I can feel through some of the chat questions, there's mixed feelings on bluebells. Some people love them, some people don't. Well, I, I, you know, I don't know. You know, everybody knows Steve Smith, our, been here for a long time, the Whistling Gardener. This was always a fun topic between him and his wife, to be honest with you, which I always chuckled at because she liked her scylla. Mm -hmm. I could walk out here in the garden and see all kinds of bluebells coming up, which are very pretty. Yeah. Um, Mr. Smith did not like them quite as much, so I let them fight it out, but that's the perfect example of one man's trash, another one's treasure. How's that? <laughs> Sounds like a very divisive uh, topic. Yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Um, so what about, uh, chickweed? What uh, product do you recommend for that? Well, same thing. If, if chickweed's a very simple one, um, I would kind of liken it more towards that popweed discussion. If you've got chickweed and I use the lawn, you know, I don't have to get a chemical. All the chemicals will do it, but you can go natural with that. Dead weed, dead weed brew would, would kill that out in the landscape. If it's in my lawn, I get that lawn weed brew and you'd be fine killing with that as well. Gotcha. Um, what about large patches? And we talked about buttercup and clover, but um, does your recommendation change if it's close to edibles, specifically grapes? Oh, that's a yeah. tough one. Um, well, A, you know, again, I, I'm trying some stuff out on, you know, because again, I'm lucky I don't have it creeping into my yard, but it is on the bank outside of my place. Um, and I try all kinds of stuff as we go through the spring and summer, like, hmm, I wonder if this will nuke that buttercup because it's a common one a lot of us fight up here I mean let's be honest um I 
you know, I don't know that I'd feel comfortable telling you something that natural is going to work that well. Um, I think if you tried the, 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 the lawn weed brew with the iron, that's going to be the safest route. I'm going to try that again this summer. Um, that's not going to hurt the soil. It's not going to hurt the grapes or anything like that. Um, I bet you it nukes what's growing. And then you're going to see it come back up and you're probably going to have to fight it a couple of sprays to maybe get the root system out of there. Um, I don't know how close it is, but and I'm not trying to make you work harder if you don't like weeding, but that's kind of the example to me. All right, what if I got the kneeling pad out? I got an area clear where I'm comfortable that I could nuke the rest of this and not have it get on any of my grape. That would be my first vote. You know, then I can go to maybe something that's a little more fail safe, but not worry about it getting right directly on top of the root system or on the bark or the foliage. Good to know. Um, and as always, you know, if there are specific questions when you get into this, hit us up, you know, by phone or email, because we're happy, you know, some of these things, it's a, it gets a little sketchy maybe when you're doing it, you know, before you do it. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask before you start a project. We're happy to help. Mm -hmm. um, what about Japanese knotweed? You know, that's at the top of the list for invasives. And I, I don't think you're going to get rid of that by any way, except for using a brush killer. You know, I, that's not even something you're going to be able to dig up. Um, I think you're going to have to get, I'll use the word murder, death, kill. You're going to have to go to the top end of a brush killer, uh, whether it's BK32 like we have. There's a zillion brand names out there. Uh, the last time I fought it was a long time ago for a friend, and we got what's called crossbow. That's another kind of higher end nasty brush killer that you'll find I'm at some stores that you know an option like that is probably going to be your your one and only option I hate to say um that's a, that's going to be a tough one gotcha um somebody mentioned crabgrass is it yep. considered a weed and does anything get rid yeah. of it is it fine to leave it you know it, it's a really tough one I mean we could talk you know, crabgrass, poa, anna, orchard grass, I mean, I go on and on. And that to me is the hardest part of herbicide discussion is, you know, we started off this by talking about selective, non-selective, pre all these different kinds of weed killers. Um, I, I don't have a magic answer that's going to spray, that's going to kill one grass and not kill another. So again, if I have crabgrass, any of the stuff in my garden, sweet, easy choice. Let's get something easy like lawn or the dead weed brew that's going to kill both grass and weeds, you know, non-selective again. If I'm talking about the lawn, that's a really tough one because I don't, you don't have options as far as a high-end chemical that's going to keep my ryegrass alive or my fescue that I want my lawn and with, with killing an annual grass that's growing in the middle of it. I fight this a lot because I'm OCD lawn guy. Um, and this is the, this is a, a touchy subject with me. Or I used to walk around with the knife or my hori hori and pop those little suckers out before they got a chance to get going. Um, it's a tough discussion. Crabgrass in particular, I will tell you, germinates early in the spring. So some people, if you don't mind going the chemical route, have done something like the weed beater complete, the, the chemical granular I talked about earlier. I know Scott's uh, puts out a HALT product called HALT. If I put that down two months ago, like in early February, that dissolves, makes a fill in my soil, and that prevents that from even growing in the first place. Yes, then you win. But yes, I've got pre-emergent. I can't put seed down, and I'm kind of stuck. So it's a it's a tough a tough solution for which grass to kill and which one to keep. <clears throat> Most people I talk to, I was just at a good customer's. I uh, brought some pictures in this last week and. She knew I was a little OCD and she's kind of the same way and was like, I can't deal with this anymore as her hands are shaking and she's showing me pictures of all these little patches in her lawn that she wanted gone. We had the same discussion about sprays and she said, you know what, I got time. I'm going to dig that crap out and get rid of it. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to go that route and you've got a patch, go outside of it a couple inches and really cut that out. You may not see the next route that's going to increase the size of that thing in the spring. Cut that out of there, fill it with some fresh topsoil, reseed it, and you're golden. I mean, it'll grow back in and you'll be fine. You know, for me, uh, and I'm not going to tell you to do this, so I'm just saying what I'm trying the last couple summers. You know, those grasses like crabgrass, poa anna, we can go on and on, um, are not as drought tolerant as our lawn. You know, if you're 
playing the fine line like I have the last couple summers. What I do is I get into June when we get warmed up. I don't water a lot anyway, but I want my grass to be green. I'm not one of those ones that goes brick hard brown turf for the summer. If you do, that's fine, but not I do not. So I don't mind paying the city of Everett for a little bit of water each summer. So I will try to decrease my watering to the point where, okay, my lawn is still green, but I can see poa, crabgrass, whatever it is, starting to turn brown because it's going dormant. It needs more water and I'm going to win. Um, you got to be really careful with a fine line because you go too far. The whole thing is going to go brown and don't come get me if it does because I'm not telling you to try this. Um, but that's what I've been doing the last couple summers and I've seen a great reduction in POA and especially in my yard. So it sounds like it's a personal preference. How how much does it bother you? How far yeah. do you want to go? Well, and, and you know, again, you know, here's my OCD speech. You know, I don't mind. I've changed my mentality. I don't mind. I mow my lawn pretty tight, more like golf course fairway. That's how I like it. You don't have to. Um, so I don't mind maybe two, three, four different shades of green. They're all grass. They're all the same height. I'm okay with that. I think the problem is with a lot of homeowners who ask this question, want their lawn left at two or three inches, and then you're going to be left with these little light green tight clumps that are down lower and all this tall grass around it. And that would drive me crazy, to be honest with you. I'd probably be out there cutting it out again. So, you know, that's kind of just another option for you. Gotcha. Um, good advice. I, you know, you've had, as always, a lot of great knowledge for us. Um, and it's, you know, a lot to absorb sometimes, which is why we record these. And we always make ourselves available because it's a lot to remember sometimes. So uh, go back, re rewatch, and or you can gra grab all the info from those slides, um, pause, screenshot, whatever you need, you know, off of the recordings um, and reach out. We love to talk plants or, you know, weed control. Even uh, weed plants, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, don't be afraid to reach out. And, and chat us up. And also, it's beautiful outside here in the Pacific Northwest today. Um, if you're local, it's a great day to be outside. Hopefully, you can stop by. You know, we love to see what's on, who's on the other side of the screen and, you know, and kind of connect faces with names uh, that we see pop up on the screen. So stop by, say hi, take a beautiful walk around the nursery with all these um, blooming plants. And it's feeling like a nursery again after the winter. It's pretty exciting stuff. So hopefully... You get to come enjoy it too. Um, and we'll see you in two weeks uh, for Japanese maples. Hopefully, if you're local, you can be one of the lucky winners of those uh, $50 gift cards that the Everett Clinic's gonna help us give away. Um, and then again, for Colorful Shrubs, that's right, on Sunday, Sunday. two weeks. Yeah, yeah, so thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Yeah. Happy spring, everybody. Hopefully we'll see you up here this afternoon. <laughs>